Thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our latest webinar from the East Sussex Eye Group. A little bit of a different one tonight for you. It's going to be a bit more interactive. Um, as usual, there's one CPD point for optometrists and dispensing opticians if you have registered via the link for this talk and are watching it live. The, um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel to watch when I've uploaded it. I will try and get the CPD to figure us out within the next uh, week or so. Um, we normally have a, the Q&A box at the bottom for questions throughout the talk, which please, if you've got any questions, post your questions at the bottom and I will present them to Mr Kashani at the end. Mr Kashani will be asking us questions this evening on his talk um, and with a, a little bit of a poll. It's something we've not done before, so hopefully it will it'll work. We haven't practised it, um, but the, the answers are anonymous, so nobody know what you've put. And then Mr. Kashani will talk about the uh, the answers we've given. So I'd like to welcome our speaker tonight. If you've joined us before, I'm sure you've seen him many times and he's very well known in our area. So he's an ophthalmic consultant surgeon at East Sussex Healthcare Trust, specialising in the management of complex retinal disorders. He performs intravitreal anti-VEGF injections, steroid implants, anterior and posterior segment laser treatments, as well as, well as high volume cataracts. He has previously been the clinical lead for the East Sussex NHS Trust and is the head of retinal services and uveitis. So tonight he's going to talk to us about the challenging cases that present to, uh, to eye casualty. And uh, I'd like to hand over to you, Mr. Kashani. Thanks, Ian. Um, as you say, a bit of a different one. Let me share my screen. Uh, and all I can see is Ian right now. Okay, so without revealing too much. So as Ian said, um, we are going to do something slightly different today. And um, it'd be good to get some feedback to see whether this works and you want to go back to kind of traditional um, uh, lectures. Um, and of course, we've got another face-to-face -face event coming up later on in the year, which I'm looking forward to. And I'm hoping to maybe even get some live patients for that. So the plan will be that I present a case. Um, you'll see a picture then you will be offered a differential diagnosis. Um, I'll give, you'll have about 10 seconds to just choose what the kind of best answer is. It is completely anonymous. Nobody will know. No one's looking at IP addresses or anything like that. So just feel free to write whatever you think. Um, the questions have two parts. One is diagnosis, one is management. Um, I will go through the, each part as we go along, because obviously if you have the diagnosis wrong, then you won't get the management right so we will go through them and i'll say why it is kind of uh, uh, you know why the answer is what it is so uh first question we've got a 64 year old female contact lens bearer with a two-week history of a painful right eye uh, the pain is severe and progressively worsening and it stops her sleeping at night her vision in the right eye is 612 left 66 normal looking corneas um, pupils are otherwise normal AC, deep and quiet, normal fundus. Uh, previous medication includes rheumatoid arthritis and a previous heart attack. So that's the eye that you're looking at. Okay, so you can just see some redness, diffuse redness uh, in the eyeball. And, you know, we come back to the history in a minute if you wish. So here's your differential diagnosis. A, anterior uveitis. B, conjunctivitis. C, scleritis. D, contact lens keratitis, and E, angle closure glaucoma. So we've got 10 seconds to choose one of those. As I said, it's completely anonymous, so write your answers. And Ian will put the poll up. Is that the result, Ian? Uh, I'm just seeing the, well, that's the poll. Let's see if this works or not. Okay, fine. So, excellent. So, we've got 11% who thinks who think it's anterior uveitis, 5% who think it's conjunctivitis, 67% uh, scleritis, 19% contact lens keratitis, and 2% enclosure. So, um, okay, so majority thought it was scleritis, and that was correct. So, let's go back to the history and see why it can't be the other. So, if you recall, we mentioned that, let's talk about anterior uveitis. Uh, we mentioned on examination the anterior chamber was quiet. There was no evidence of anterior chamber activity. 
So if was, this was anterior uveitis, they would, you would have seen cells in the anterior chamber. Conjunctivitis could be uh, an answer which would have gone with kind of the normal cornea, normal pupils, normal um, anterior chambers. Uh, but conjunctivitis is not severe and it doesn't stop you sleeping at night. This kind of uh, question of uh, people not being able to sleep at night is very typical of scleritis. So often you see a patient with a red eye that comes in and holding the kind of eye in the, you know, holding the head like this and they can't kind of stand light and they haven't gone to work, they can't sleep. That's very indicative, the scleritis. And in these cases, the AC is uh, quiet. We did mention she was a contact lens wearer, so you were quite right to think contact lens keratitis, but um, we said that the cornea was clear. So that would count out contact lens keratitis. In um, CL keratitis, you would see um, an infiltrate on the cornea, uh, which was staying up. So if you haven't got that, then that's uh, not correct. Angle closure glaucoma tends to give you much worse vision, not 612, and the pupil would not be reactive normally if you've got angle closure, it'd be semi dilated. So, okay, well done to the 67%. We got it right. I'm going to close the poll now. Now we're going down to management. So, got another uh, 10 seconds. So, what would be your preferred management plan? Topical ofloxacin, topical paraphenicol, topical dexamethasone, oral indomethacin, which is a non steroidal, and omeprazole, or oral diamox. So, um, we got 10 seconds and then Ian can give us the answer. Well, see what you guys think. Okay, Ian, have we got? Hang on, Shah, we've just got a bit of a- We're still sharing the first one. Oh, right, poll started. Ah. So topical ofloxacin, topical chronophenicol, topical dexamethasone, oral indomethacin, which is a non-steroidal, anomeprazole, and oral diamox. Okay, so uh, again, majority actually uh, didn't get this one right. So. Uh, which is good, actually, because that's why we, we, we're kind of talking about it in teaching. So ofloxacin is an antibiotic. So uh, scleritis is not an, in, well, it can be infective. You can have infect, uh, scleritis from an infection, but that's not the etiology here because the patient has rheumatoid arthritis. So it's an inflammatory condition and you use topical ofloxacin for contact lens keratitis um, hourly. Topical paraphenicol would be more useful if you were worried about some sort of bacterial conjunctivitis or you wanted to cover um, a bacterial kind of cause for conjunctivitis, but not, not anything else. Oral diamox brings the pressure down. So we use oral diamox in patients um, in, who have angle closure glaucoma and you need to bring the pressure down. So the choice is, do you go for a topical steroid or do you go for an oral, um, non, you know, non-steroidal? Um, although you can use topical dexamethasone to calm the surface of the eye, but really patients with scleritis uh, need um, non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatories, high dose in the methacin, high dose Voltrol um, and omeprazole to cover uh, cover the stomach. And if they can't take um, anti or oral anti-inflammatories like that, um, then you would think about uh, steroid tablets actually to manage them. If you think that there is a big element of, uh, you know, the rheumatoid arthritis playing a role here, um, and there is a risk that the sclera might melt, then they need um, very aggressive immunosuppression with steroids. Um, and if you don't do that, um, then you can get something like this. As a picture, hopefully we don't see much. And if you're, some of you can see, you can, you can see the iris there, okay? And the pupil and this big thing bulging through the sclera is choroid. So this eye is, this eye is gone really, you can't, there's not much you can do about this eye. So that's a, a necrotizing scleritis. So this kind of patients need very aggressive immunosuppression um, in order to, to manage it. And I think I've just completely messed up the next question. Like Ian's gonna kill me because actually that was one of the questions, um, which is a shame, never mind. <laughs> so you've got that one, you've got that one on the house. So, um, so here, 
uh, you know, we've mentioned subconjunctival hemorrhage, scleral necrosis, scleral nevus, pterygium, choroidal rupture. Actually, what it is, is you've got scleral necrosis. Um, Ian, sorry, don't kill me. Um, okay, we go to the second case. So, so this was a patient with scleritis and treatment is oral non-steroidals, unless you think they need severe immunosuppression, often drops on their own will not work. Scleritis patients need um, aggressive anti-inflammatory control in form of oral or sometimes IV treatment if you think the sclerosis is gonna melt. Okay, second case. So we've got a 31 year old vegan man who presents with the following incidental finding. Um, no significant medical history of note. He's heavy history of, he has heavy history of alcohol abuse and he is a smoker. 20 pack years means 20 cigarettes a day for 20 years. That's how we measure this, we measure that. So here is your clinical finding. Oh, sorry. So just, so these are Goldman visual fields and these are obviously optic nerve right, optic nerve left. So just have a good look at that before I, um, before we move. Um, the, blue dot here is a blind spot, okay? Right, so what are the clinical findings? Normal disc and normal visual fields, binasal atrophy and bitemporal visual field defect, bitemporal atrophy and arcuate defect both eyes, bitemporal atrophy and central visual field defect, binasal atrophy and central visual field defect. So have a look again. So essentially, have a look. Oh, thanks, Ian. So those are the clinical findings. So look at, see where the disc is not quite right, if that's the case, and try and come up and see what the visual fields or what kind of visual field defect that is. Okay, do you want to now have a go at saying what it is. When you're ready, Ian. Okay, so we've got a we've got quite a mixture here. So if you actually look at the clinical, hopefully you can see my arrow here. So as I mentioned to you, that's the right eye, that's the left eye, that's the macula on either side. So the disc looks quite normal on the nasal side. You see a very nice looking disc, but quite atrophic on the temporal. So from a disc point of view, it's not normal. So the first one is wrong. And answer two and five are wrong because it says binasal atrophy, which is not correct. So you've got bitemporal atrophy of the disc. And then you need to decide what the visual field defect is. So if that is blind spot, then this is central. So you have got uh, bitemporal atrophy, sorry, bitemporal disc atrophy and central visual field defect, okay? So people who got bitemporal atrophy, et cetera. So 38%, most of you uh, got that right, well done. So now the next question, so remember of the history, so you've got a vegan man who drinks a lot, smokes a lot, and who has got atrophy of the optic nerves and associated uh, visual field defect, central visual field defect. Can you now tell me what, which one of these tests would be the most appropriate test? I'm not saying some of them, you know, some of them are uh, right or wrong, they might, you might think that actually you could do all of these things as part of your investigation um, workup with these patients, but actually only one of them is super relevant given the history um, and, and the findings. So would you do an ESR, CRP? Would you do a CT scan of the orbit? Would you send them for electrodiagnostics? Would you do a B12 at folate level or would you take a detailed family history? So make your choices known, and then we can go ahead with explaining. Oh, 
Okay, so again, majority got that right. B12 and folate level uh, is actually what you want. Um, ESR and CRP is important in any kind of investigations of retinal disorders or optic nerve pathology, especially if you think somebody has a swollen disc and you're worried that they might be arthritic or they might have GCA or some sort of inflammation going on. So that's not an unreasonable answer, but we don't have swelling here. We have atrophy. So you've got a process that's taken time and is chronic looking. Um, CT, absolutely. Again, probably an MRI would be better if you're looking for any kind of compression uh, or anything else that might be uh, going on there. So really we do neuroimaging um, on patients with abnormal looking discs in order to see whether um, you know, there's something compressing um, on the nerve or, or, or not. But again, in this case, um, the history of being vegan meant that they're, that was important because that meant they're getting certain amount of, they're not getting certain amount of nutrients, which you find in meat, like B12 and folate. Another problem that patients have who uh, take a lot of alcohol is that they become anemic and uh, they have, again, deficiency of B12 and folate. So B12 and folate is, uh, is a cause of optic nerve atrophy and central scotomas. Uh, family history is more if um, you felt that, uh, you know, this was some sort of hereditary optic nerve disease. Electrodiagnostics, again, not very useful. Um, you, we mainly use it in order to see whether the problem is coming from the macula, general retina, or optic nerve. So if you've got somebody with um, I don't know, some retinitis pigmentosa or cone dystrophy, um, or, or you know, you're trying to investigate functional vision loss, um, you know, examination is normal, but they can't see electrodiagnostics is quite objective way of measuring how things are functioning. But in this case, uh, you know, the history and, and, and everything else was pointing out to a nutritional uh, optic neuropathy, which is B12 and folate. As I said, as part of your workup, of course, you take a family history, you might do neuroimaging, you do inflammatory markers, and you might even do electrodiagnostics, but the most obvious answer was B12 and folate. Okay, good. Going to the next case. So we've got a 39 year old female who has reduced vision in both eyes over a few weeks. Okay, so she's 39, reduced vision in both eyes. She has night blindness in both eyes. So she notices that at night her vision is not very good. She has floaters in both eyes. Vision is down 615 on the right, 624 on the left with normal anterior segment examination and the color vision is down in both eyes, okay? Uh, we've done some bloods already, so the infection screen is negative and inflammatory markers are normal, and you have edema of macula in both eyes. So I'm gonna show you the picture now. So remember, reduced vision, 615 on the right, 624 on the left, macular edema in both eyes, normal infection screen, so we've checked for the HIVs, TB, syphilis, you know, uh, so the infection screen is okay. And as I said, you've just got macroedema in both eyes. So have a look at these pictures. So clearly uh, we've taken various fundus photos. Um, so what's the most likely diagnosis? Could it be CSR? Is it tuberculosis? Ampi, which is... Um, a condition that affects a particular part of the retina? Could it be lymphoma? Or could it be bird-shot chorioretinopathy? I'm going to go back to the picture so Ian can put the poll up when you're looking at the pictures. So 39-year-old macular edema, both eyes. And Remember what we said about the infection screen and everything else? Okay. Let's have your results now. Okay, so we thought, some thought CSR, some thought TB, MP 10%, lymphoma 13%. Majority, again, thought Berchart, chorioretinopathy, which is, Bang on the money, so that's the correct answer. So let's just go through some of these uh, question um, answers and see why why they're not true. So uh, CSR, 
I presume some people chose that because we said there was macroedema in both eyes. Uh, CSR is quite unusual to be present in both eyes. Normally it's unilateral, but of course you can get bilateral CSR and they can be multifocal. But clue here really was the retina. If you see the retina doesn't look normal, you can see these kind of white lesions all over the peripheral retina. See these white kind of uh, lesions everywhere, yeah, uh, across the retina. The nerves kind of look okay, but you can just see that the whole of retina has got very kind of well-defined white lesions, which affect choroidal level, because you can see the blood vessels in the retina going over them. So if you think most blood vessels are quite superficial on the retina, some run uh, kind of a little bit through the middle part of the retina, you can see that these lesions are not blunting what you can see on the retina. You can see the blood vessels going completely, completely over. So there must be the lesion must be either at the RPE level or sub-RPE level. Tuberculosis actually is not a bad chance because um, actually TB, miliary TB could look like that. Miliary TB is, the, is when you have um, TB that's spread everywhere. And certainly in the eye, it can look like that. Lots of little granulomas within the choroid. Although the commonest manifestation of TB uh, tends to be a single granuloma or a single nodule. Um, you know, you can't get TB like that. We did say that the infection screen was negative. So TB screen was negative. But even if TB test is negative, this could have been TB as well. So that's probably my, my choice number two uh, when it comes to looking at these patients. So MP or acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epithelial. That's a, that's a big name. Um, and that tends to be more central. So you tend to see central uh, pigment, kind of pigmentary lesion with kind of white areas as well, deep in the retina. Um, but you don't tend to see these lesions in the periphery. So that's why it's not AMPI because AMPI is a lot more central. Um, and you don't tend to have that much in a way of floaters with AMPI um, either. Um, and the fact that all the lesions are peripheral is unlike birdshot. Lymphoma is again a good shout. Again, you can see kind of infiltration of the uh, retina. It tends to be lymphoma tends to kind of be present on the retina as well. So you can see these swathes of uh, retina tissue being covered by this yellow um, lesion in lymphoma. Lymphoma is more retinal. Um, it can infiltrate the optic nerve as well. It can kind of present in choroid, but it doesn't tend to present like these discrete white lesions in the back of the eye. Um, this is birdshot. So birdshot choreotomopathy uh, presents with uh, exactly like this. It looks as if, you know, you have, the, it gets the name from um, as if you're shooting birds and how you get pellets in the air um, and you get those little kind of yellow dots uh, within the retina. And actually it tends to present with macular edema floaters. Uh, thanks, and you can take the poll down. So just remember one thing that inflammatory uh, uh, causes of uh, uveitis, so inflammatory uveitis tend to cause macular edema a lot more than infectious uveitis. So patients who often have syphilis or TB or you know things like that causing uveitis don't tend to have macular edema. Uh, but patients with VKH and um, birdshot, et cetera, will often have macular edema. So we know what it is. How would you treat it? So here's your next question. Would you give the patient oral prednisolone, oral azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, very good for treating patients with infectious uveitis, topical dexamethasone alone, intravitreal triamcelinone, or would you just observe? Thank you. Okay, um, whenever you get a minute, let's have a look. Okay, good. Yes, I'm pleased to say most of you got this right again, oral prednisolone. So systemic immunosuppression is a way to treat this condition. Why? Um, again, with any patient with uveitis, if you have inflammation that's affecting the choroid like that, giving you macular edema and the vision is down, you need systemic immunosuppression to, to sort this out. 
Um, I wouldn't observe because the vision is down. So you've got macular edema and reduced vision, you need to do something. So that's why observation wouldn't be right. Sometimes you can observe while you're doing your investigations because if you've got an infective cause for your uveitis and you don't want to start or penicillin, you know, you could wait until you've done the investigations and then direct your treatment accordingly. But when you have got sight threats, you know, threats to sight, i.e. macular is involved, you know, the optic nerve might be threatened or something like that, you need to start. Um, intravitreal tramcellin is pretty much not used at all now, although it used to be used quite a lot before Ozodex was around. We now have a preservative-free, um, you know, steroid implant that we can use for management of non-infectious uveitis. Uh, the problem with any intravitreal injection is once it goes in, it can't come out. So you need to be absolutely sure that the inflammation that you're treating in order to manage the, you know, inflammation within the eye uh, th th is not infectious because if it is infectious, then you've just injected with a steroid and that's going to be very difficult to retrieve. Topical dexamethasone, probably not great because the vision is quite a lot down. Um, bird shot, the lesions are within the choroid and drops applied on the cornea is not going to get to the back of the eye. And that's why oral penicillin is the correct answer. Often patients with bird shot choreotopathy need lifelong immunosuppression. So you start them up with oral penicillin, and then after a while, as you're reducing the steroid, you introduce a second line agent like as a thioprene or Cellcept in order to wean them off the steroids. Generally, in management of uveitis, if you've got anyone who requires oral penicillin, more than 10 milligrams a day, uh, because of risk of osteoporosis, diabetes, all the things that go with oral penicillin, you need to really think about a second line immunosuppression to wean them off uh, oral penicillin. So yeah, that was the trick for that. And oral azithromycin is not great because it's not infectious um, and um, an antibiotic is, is, is not an infection. So antibiotic is not required here. Good. Um, azithromycin, by the way, is quite a good drug to start patients when you've got somebody with inflammation and you're not sure if it's infectious or non-infectious. So you can, so you know, if you've got somebody presenting with uveitis and you know what's going on, you can give them azithromycin, cover them well a cyclovir in case you think there's a viral cause and give them a little bit of steroid while all the investigation is coming back. But that, that in itself would be a different lecture. I'm, I wouldn't want to bore you guys with that tonight. So uh, case number four. Okay, so here is the anterior segment photo of this patient. I'm not going to give you any other history beyond that. So just have a good look. So, um, what is the likely diagnosis? Is it subconjunctival hemorrhage, squamous cell carcinoma, viral conjunctivitis, herpetic simplex keratitis, or vernal keratoconjunctivitis? So uh, I'm gonna go back to the picture. You can see the cornea there, and you can see the lesion here. So is it a subconjunct hemorrhage, squamous cell carcinoma, Viral conjunctivitis, herpes simplex keratitis, keratoconjunctivitis. Let's see. Good. Not many uh, people thought so. So, so clearly, um, if you just have it, there's no hemorrhage here. So subconscious hemorrhage wouldn't be correct. Um, none of you thought viral conjunctivitis, which is excellent because you can see this kind of clearly an abnormal mass that is emanating from uh, conjunctiva and almost covering the cornea. So, you know, conjunctivitis doesn't do that. You can get kind of serous fluid underneath the conj, but it doesn't do that. Herpes simplex keratitis, so that should be on the cornea, not on the conjunctiva, hence the name keratitis, okay? Vernal keratoconjunctivitis, again, will kind of look very similar. You see follicles and, uh, you know, uh, papules and stuff like that. That's kind of more on the palpebral side rather than the bulbar side. Uh, you can just see abnormal blood vessels, just very horrible looking lesion emanating from the um, uh, conjunctiva. So this is uh, squamous cell carcinoma, unless proven otherwise, this patient needs an urgent biopsy 
and uh, aggressive treatment. Good. Okay, so next question. Um, so I'm looking at my phone, by the way, because I know what slide is coming up and I don't want to mess up like I did at the first case. 32-year-old man presents with blurred vision in the right and left eye. He's on aggressive chemotherapy for metastatic testicular cancer. Okay. Symptoms appear when he was driving home from when he was driving home from the gym. So he'd gone to the gym, and as he was driving home, he started to get these symptoms. Uh, six, twelve vision on the right, counting fingers on the left. Uh, what it should actually, uh, I'm going to make this a little bit easier. So, 30 year old man, yeah, on aggressive chemotherapy for metastatic cancer, cancer. Symptoms appear when he was at the gym. Not driving home from you. So when he was at the gym. So vision six off on the right, counting fingers on the left. This is the right eye. Okay. So you can see something going on there. This is the left. Okay. And here is your differential diagnosis. Is this retinal vein occlusion? Is this metastatic tumor infiltrating the retina? Is it Valsalva retinopathy? Is it lymphoma? Is it malignant hypertension? So I'm going to go back to this picture if Ian can put the poll up. So this chap, unfortunate person, is having treatment for uh, cancer with chemotherapy uh, and metastatic, which means that the tumor has spread. So um, and he was in the gym and this suddenly happens, loses vision suddenly in the left eye and a bit blurred in the right. What do you think is happening? I wonder how, what's gonna be the main answer with this one. Okay, good. I'm glad to see most of you are getting uh, all the questions right, which is amazing. So actually, a few good shots here, uh, to be fair. So retinal vein occlusion. Um, so normally with retinal vein occlusion, you would see uh, obviously blood vessel tortuosity. There will be an arteriovenous nip. The hemorrhage will be within more within the retina. Over here, you can see what looks like a fluid level. So this is hemorrhage that's occurred at the retinal, uh, superficial retinal capillary level, and the blood is trapped between vitreous and retinal. Uh, whereas in retinal vein occlusion, the hemorrhage is within the middle layer of the retina, as you will see typically in a BRBO. So, so this is uh, kind of um, prehyloid hemorrhage with what we would call a a fluid level, and you've got blood between a uh, very superficial layer of the retina and vitreous. Uh, if the vitreous was detached completely in this patient, you would, this would present as a vitreous hemorrhage, for example. Um, so tumor infusion in the retina, you know, these could look a bit weird, can they? You just think, what are these white lesions, cerebral hemorrhage? If you had tumor infiltration, often these wouldn't be retinal, these would be probably choroidal, because that's where how tumors spread to, to choroid and liver and lung, et cetera, not on the retina. I know these are retinal lesions because you can't see the blood vessels underneath them. So these are superficial lesions that are affecting uh, the problem. So tumors would not be uh, correct. Same with lymphoma. I did mention to you that lymphoma does affect the retina. So that's quite right. But lymphoma doesn't look red. Lymphoma looks like this yellow sheet of um, abnormal cells covering the superficial layer. Mm -hmm. So lymphoma wouldn't be correct. Probably the closest call is between um, val uh, Valsalva retinopathy and malignant hypertension. So malignant hypertension, you tend to see disc swelling uh, because the blood pressure is very high and him being in the gym would have been kind of a clue there, uh, but also just hemorrhages around the disc and um, this is this is typical of Valsalva retinopathy. So um, he basically was straining quite a lot at the gym, and then you get bleeding of the uh, superficial uh, blood vessels, uh, causing a picture like that. So 
how would you treat that patient? Would you treat with observation? Would you treat with vitrectomy, anti-VEGF therapy, YAG laser tra treatment, or blood transfusion with platelets? So if we can have the call up, thank you. So let me go back to that picture. So would you treat this with observation? Would you just watch it? So remember vision was counting fingers in this eye. There was 612 in the other eye. Uh, let's show you the other one. Would you do vitrectomy? Would you inject with ILEA or Bobismo, Lucentis, Sebastian? Would you laser it? Uh, or would you transfuse them with platelets? Okay. So probably a little bit unfair because I didn't tell you what, a, what the blood count was. So those of you who've written platelets, I probably forgive a little bit. Observation is fine. And actually you probably would observe this one because there's not much you can do about the right eye. But I would say that actually this eye has counting fingers. And the problem is that is if you leave blood like that next to the fovea, you're going to um, cause iron toxicity and you might not be able to get the vision back. So um, in certain situations, you would even consider observing this kind of patient, but because the vision is counting fingers, you probably wouldn't and you probably would want to do something about it. Anti-VEGF is not indicated because this does not, I know we fix everything with anti-VEGF, but the etiology of this problem isn't because the retina is ischemic and the VEGF levels are up. The etiology is that the, you know, the patient was straining and you, you know, he essentially burst the superficial blood vessels. Um, you would think with chemotherapy, his platelets are low, so maybe that's why he bled. And generally in that kind of situation, you may think about giving them infusions to get the platelets up, or normally they don't tend to transfuse with platelets actually, but you know. Um, surprisingly, those of you who thought, yeah, glazer treatment, that was the correct answer. And I wanna just show you a picture here. So, Actually, I've done one of these. This is not what this is not the one I did, but it was uh, you know it was more, it was great fun. So essentially, the problem is you need to get that blood into the vitreous and cause a vitreous hemorrhage because that blood is trapped between uh, the retina and the back part of the vitreous. So using YAG laser, obviously, very much avoiding the center where you think fovea is, just at the bottom here. You do a couple of shots, and you can see very nicely here that the blood will go into the vitreous and it will drain right down. One of the issues with observation is this, is that the blood can kind of clot and fibrose and then it can damage the fovea and then you've got any chance you've got at managing the situation. So, so yeah, glazes, so unusually, uh, you know, the, very few people got this right. I mean, you've been getting everything else right. So. So YAG laser treatment in order to drain subhyaluric hemorrhage. Um, and just literally a couple of shots and the blood goes from the space between retina and vitreous into the vitreous gel. So it must cause induce a vitreous hemorrhage, but the macula then gets drained. Very nice picture, which isn't mine, unfortunately. Okay, so next case. Uh, there's two more cases. So we, we're doing well for time. A uh, 48-year-old man presents with vision loss in both eyes and pain. So vision on the right is 660. Uh, vision on the left is 648. You can see just enough, see that there's no macular edema. Pay attention to what looks on the cornea here, okay? And the pupil shape, so very poor vision. That's the view of the retina. So you can just about see the optic nerves, some white stuff going on here, white lines, okay? And uh, just want you to think about the quality of the picture that you're looking at. So what are the clinical findings? We've got choroiditis and disswelling, retinitis and vitritis, 
mild vitritis, retinal vasculitis, and significant vitritis, optic atrophy and vitritis, and uveitis. So uh, if you pull that up, we go back to the clinical picture here. So that's the picture I'm after. Oops, sorry. So have we got choroiditis and disc swelling, retinitis and mild disc swelling, retinal vasculitis, which is inflammation of the retinal vessels, significant vitritis, atrophy of the optic nerve and vitritis or pan-uveitis. Okay, so we've got choroiditis. So let's let's just look at the picture. So what you can see here is a very blurry picture of the retina. So if you ever presented with uh, a patient with possible inflammation, you know they have inflammation because you've seen uh, that the anterior chamber of the eye has this um, modern fat KPs on the back part of the cornea. You can see that the pupil was not formed, so you know some inflammation is going on. Um, and you also can see that the back of the eye is not very clear. So in that scenario, uh, the, you know there must be significant vitritis going on. Uh, otherwise, you would have been able to take a very nice picture of the retina. So in fact, patients who are very immunodeficient, like patients with AIDS or conditions like that, where they don't mount an inflammatory response, um, often you can see you know, infections and all sorts of things in the back of the retina without any difficulty because they don't have enough immune system to mount an inflammation. And often immunocompetent patients who can mount an inflammatory response will present with a lot of inflammation like that. So you've got vitritis for sure. The disc looks fairly okay. So there's no disc swelling here. And we can't really see what's happening in the choroid. I mean, the retina looks fairly fine. What you do see is blood vessels. These are, these are blood vessels that have got, uh, you know, kind of white lines around them. And that's what you see as vasculitis. So this patient has retinal vasculitis and a significant vitritis, which 20% of you got. Uh, Panuveitis is more of a term uh, which entails inflammation of the front and the back part of the eye. This is more of a retinal vasculitis. Um, so there is inflammation at the front and back. I wanted you guys to have picked up the, the blood vessels because that's significant as these can block. So retinal vasculitis and significant vitritis are the clinical findings. Now, I'm gonna show you this. So this is a peripheral shot of the retina, okay? So you can see that's normal retina, and then you can see this, okay? Is this acute retinal necrosis? Is it CMV retinitis? Is it multifocal choroiditis? Is it non-granulomatous anterior or is it scleritis? So let's go back to this picture here. So this is a picture of the retina. Ian, can we have the, thank you. So which one of these are the most likely is it scleritis? Can ask yourself, does sclera affect the retina? Is it a non-granulomatous anterior uveitis? You saw pictures of the uh, cornea. Did it look granulomatous or non-granulomatous? Is it multifocal choroiditis? Just got to think where, you know, where this, where this is. What at what level is this at? Is it CMV retinitis? So cytomegalovirus retinitis, or is it acute retinal necrosis? Okay. ta -da. Yes. Oh, what a close call, actually. So the top two. So yeah, these are the differentials. Um, has the patient got acute retinal necrosis or CMV retinitis? It's not scleritis because obviously you've got the fundus, um, not the sclera and scleritis, although um, posterior scleritis can affect the fundus in form of serous detachment. You don't get white lesion like this at the back of the retina. 
it's not non-granulomatous. This is granulomatous uveitis, okay? So if you look at the cornea here, when you see these yellow lesions on the cornea, what we call mutton fat KPs, that's indication of a granulomatous uveitis, like sarcoid, TB, things like that. Uh, multifocal chorelitis is not a bad shout, but multifocal chorelitis tend to present just with yellow lesions within the choroid. And you can see here, you've got like this abnormal uh, infiltration of the retinomes. So this is some sort of retinitis. Um, and um, the question is, is it acute retinal necrosis or is it CMV retinitis? Well, that's a tricky one. So CMV retinitis tends to occur in patients who are very immunodeficient. And if you recall, as I said, immunodeficient patients don't have vitritis. So when you see CMV retinitis, you tend to see it in, in patients who have got hardly any vitritis and you can often get very good pictures of it. Uh, whereas acute retinal necrosis, which is done by um, various, you know, herpes zoster or herpes simplex, tends to happen in immunocompetent patients who can mount a response. So, so this picture here is acute retinal necrosis. So about 40% of you got that one. Good, last case, and um, you're bang on time, so that's good. 76-year-old hypertensive patient, sudden onset of floaters and vision loss in the left eye, right VA66, left VA624, patient is on aspirin. So here is the picture that you need to see. I've marked certain things for you. So please take a note. You've got these yellow lesions here. You've got this thing here which is quite anterior. You've got this here, you've got that there, and you've got this thing here, okay? So you've got these three things, and I've given you a clue as well. So you need to know what VH stands for, intra, and then sub. Okay, so it's quite nice to see the color, and then fluorescein, okay? So, what is a likely diagnosis? Is this patient, has this patient got wet macular degeneration, retinal vein occlusion, valsalva retinopathy, macro aneurysm, or diabetic eye disease? I'm gonna go back to the picture. So if we can have the poll up. Okay, let's see. Right, okay. So let's go through these options. Um, actually, so this is quite a tricky, tricky case really because all the yellow stuff, if you look at, again, look at the blood vessels, you need to identify where anatomically these lesions are and then try and make sense of them. So those of you who thought these were exudates, exudates are quite superficial and they don't occur in such massive quantities like that. So this is, this is drusen. So these are RPE level drusen all over the fundus. So this patient's got lots and lots of scattered drusen. You can see blood vessels overlying them, okay? Uh, whereas if these were retinal exudations, it, it, they might blunt the blood vessels. So that's number one. Number two is the clue is in this pale lesion. And if you follow the lesion, it is coming off an artery. So vein, artery, veins are uh, redder and wider than arteries. So if you, if you follow the artery there, then you can see that there's like a, almost like an out pouch of the artery. And what you can see here is obviously hemorrhage within the vitreous. You've got hemorrhage within, um, sorry, uh, uh, within the retina and you've got hemorrhage sub RPE. So macroaneurysm is one of the very few conditions that can kind of give you this tri-layer hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage, intraretinal and uh, sub RPE. 
And that was the right answer here, which I'm glad to see 56% of you got. So it's not diabetic eye disease because these are not exudations, if you thought they were. Um, and also diabetic eye disease doesn't tend to cause hemorrhage like this. If you get big hemorrhage like that, then that's coming from new vessels or something like that. Um, and then, um, sorry, the other uh, options, I took it up, sorry. I'm not, uh, yeah, so Valsalva retopathy, if you recall, uh, it was kind of from the superficial vessels. It wasn't coming off the big artery and there was kind of hemorrhage between the retina and, and the back part of the uh, vitreous. So again, this clearly is hemorrhage spanning across the retina. So it's not going to be Valsalva retopathy. Retinal vein occlusion doesn't look like this at all. You tend to see hemorrhages within the retina um, and you don't get a white lump in, in there. Um, a wet AMD could, could look like that, but with wet AMD, the abnormal problem is coming from the choroid and not the retina. And here you can see that, you know, we have got a lesion, sorry, uh, from within an arterial. So a macroaneurysm is an abnormal dilation within the first three divisions um, of the artery coming out. So it's generally fairly central and it follows the path of the artery. Wet AMD, you would expect to be more central and more macular. You could say that this is this could be disciform, and you'd be right to think that that would be a good differential, but it's not, it's a macro. Um, and then the question is, what is the treatment for it? Is it PDT laser, intravitreal ilea, intravitreal osidex, vitrectomy, argon laser to macroaneurysm? So let's see what you guys think about that. Interesting. Okay, so, so PDT laser was used uh, for treatment of wet macular degeneration uh, before anti VEGF came around. We don't use it anymore. We do use PDT for management of chronic CSR, um, and it's not really done more than that. You have to have infusion of um, a drug called metaphorin, and then they focus the uh, laser on the macular half fluence. Uh, for, I think it's about, I don't know, X number of seconds to get rid of the fluid. So, so the, only, it, the only kind of thing we use PDT laser for is management of CSR and some type of cancers within the eye. Um, intravitreal ilia would suggest that there is an anti-VEGF etiology. So you have to have some sort of scheme here to manage that. So obviously if you thought this was better AMD, you may have then decided to go for ILEA, but, but it's not AMD, so ILEA is not correct. Intravitreal Ozodex would suggest an inflammatory uh, response or reaction. Again, you can use that for retinal vein occlusion. You can use it for um, uh, non-infectious uveitis, but again, this is a macroanism. Vitrectomy you can do if there's significant and horrendous vitreous hemorrhage, which there wasn't in this case, because you can still see. So actually the answer, as 52% of you got, is argon laser to macro. And this is kind of quite, um, so what you need to do is you need to um, have the laser right over the macro, and you want low power but high duration. So just like a slow burn over the macro to close the macro aneurysm off. Um, and it has the risk of blocking the artery. So you can cause um, branches or arterial occlusion with that. And Or if you go too heavy and you're not careful, you can burst the macro and you can have a massive vitreous hemorrhage. So uh, they're fun to do, but not for the faint-hearted. Um, uh, but when you do, you know, you do need to manage it because the, the macros can cause a huge leakage and um, exudation towards the fovea. Um, and then that would be that would be quite problematic. I think actually uh, that's it. You've 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 done it all. Uh, so I'm going to now stop sharing. Look at that, uh, and give Ian the floor. Hi, Sha. I'm just going to put the light on. 
I, I, I thought you were you sleeping? No, 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 I was trying taking photos and the, the light was reflecting off the screen. Oh my I think, god. It was I think that went well with the polls. I think I did well sharing the polls. Yeah, you did really well. Thanks. I wanted to actually I should thank Ian for two reasons. One, the polls were extremely difficult to sort out, which he did I had absolutely nothing to do with that because I'm rubbish at IT. And secondly, he has given up his time for Love Island to be here with us today. So thank you, Ian. What, what, what's Love Island? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, what's your, what you said you wanted to finish for nine o'clock. Oh, right, yeah. Do you know what time it starts? Because <laughs> you told me you need to be finished by nine. <laughs> um, I'm just looking at the questions. There's lots of questions about people struggling with polls on the phone. Oh. Um, and love this format. So that was a good idea of mine, wasn't it? Um, page five. Valsalva hemorrhage was victrectomy a treatment option? Uh, let me have a look. Um, yes, only if so. If you're going to do vitrectomy, uh, there needs to be significant vitreous hemorrhage. So, as long as you can see the retina, uh, you can see the macro, or you can see the kind of uh, subhyoid hemorrhage obscuring the fovea, if you can see it, then you can use YAG laser to treat it. You don't need vitrectomy. You only need vitrectomy when you can't see kind of uh, the retina or you, you, you don't feel or there's enough vitreous hemorrhage to stop you lasering. Perfect. Um, I think because we've done the poll, that's the only question I can see. There's lots there of- There is an interesting about... comment. Uh, good uh, good form, an interesting comment. Uh, Yeah, there's an interesting comment to say that some of the answer, they, they add up to more than 100. Can you actually, Paul, can you vote twice or? Oh no, because there is, sorry, of course, there's 134 people, yeah. Yeah, I think you can, on some of the, you can vote more than one option, I think. So you okay. could vote well, two options, but yeah. If you guys like this kind of uh, format, we don't, I'm not saying we'll do it every time, but certainly we can incorporate that because I think it's just, um, sometimes you just listen to a lecture and things can just go on and like Ian, you can fall asleep. Uh, but, you know, sometimes when you're being asked questions, I think, you know, and I think GOC likes that as well, don't they? That I think they do. Have interaction going. This was just a practice tonight, so we could see how it went. So there's no CPD points tonight because we're doing it real for real next week, aren't we, Shah? Is that right? Is that what you said? <laughs> don't scare them, Ian. Bloody uh, hell. So um, well, one question is, here. Yeah, please, don't listen to Do you not treat scleritis with oral ibuprofen over the counter? No, because the dose that you need is much higher. So when you go scleritis, you need mega doses. Um, uh, I mean, you can take them over the counter, but I think it's a bit higher than you normally would do, like you would take for a headache. So mm -hmm. you know, if you take 400 milligrams for a headache, then the dose is higher. I need to, to look up. We used to have a very good drug called Frobin, which was given 50 milligrams three times a day. They've stopped that now. So we either use high dose Voltrol or Indomethacin. And uh, if that doesn't work, then we would go over to oral prednisolone or if they've got a history of gastric ulcers and things like that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Will there always be signs of anterior uveitis when there is a retinal vasculitis? No, no. So um, often anterior uveitis in context of retinal vasculitis would be present if there's an inflammatory cause. Um, some of the connective tissue disorders or things like systemic lupus erythematous, things like that, can cause retinal vasculitis. Or patients with antiphospholipid syndrome can get retinal vasculitis without anterior chamber activity. So anterior chamber activity just indicates, so thing with inflammation, you've just got to pick up, put up the history, put up the signs and try and see what pattern it follows. So definitely not always. You can just purely have vasculitis without anterior uveitis. Cool. I'll just clarify. When I said there was a tonight's a practice and there's no CPD points, I'm joking. There will be CPD points. <laughs> Before we go to the next question, I got myself uh, in trouble there, didn't I? Um, on the macro aneurysm fundus photo, where would you target the argon laser specifically? Right on the macro. So that's why we sometimes do fluorescein. If the hemorrhage is covering it, it can be difficult to see, but you can normally follow the blood vessel and see where they're kind of white out pouches and you have to go treat the macro itself. Otherwise you're not gonna close it. And, and it's very different to laser treatment you do for diabetes or anything like that, where you're generally lasering the retina. This is bang on the macro itself. And you have to be um, 
gentle with the laser so the power can't be too high, but it just needs to be long duration to close off the macro. Cool. And on your case about the vegan, would the vegan recover with treatment? Yes, but I mean, you would, of course, you need to replenish with B12 and folate. Um, I mean, if you've got um, optic nerve atrophy, then you probably will have some, some sort of defect. I'm not, well, your nerve won't re recoup, but you just stop, stop them getting worse. So any patient with paracentral, uh, sorry, central scotoma and optic atrophy, you need to think of B12 folate. And that, and you know, the, you have to get the kind of B12 and folate levels checked. So with that, you would hopefully just stop the progression of the visual field defect. But once you've lost the visual field defect from damage to your optic nerve, that won't come back. Can you advise ibuprofen for episcleritis? No, because scleritis is kind of more deeper within the eye. That's why you need oral treatment for it. Episcleritis can be managed topically. So any condition you can manage with just drops, you should manage with drops because that's, that will cause the least amount of side effect and you know, the scleral vessels are superficial to sclera. You can easily manage that and often the pain is not bad enough to warrant uh, high dose of oral um, non steroidals to manage it. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't. I mean, you can use paracetamol, but, but episcleritis doesn't tend to cause that much pain anyway. So I think you're, the way you should think always kind of, what is the kind of most direct way I can treat this condition with the least amount of side effects? And often it's topical, you know, regional, like Ozodex, uh, subtenons, and then oral. So oral prednisolone for us often is kind of the last resort. If, for example, the condition is bilateral and needs systemic therapy. So is it secondary to a systemic condition or is it in, in both eyes and you need to treat deeper tissues than you think oral? But otherwise, if you can get away with topical or regional, that's what you need. Cool. I think we'll just last question. Would you recommend good B12 and folate levels for glaucoma and glaucoma suspect patients? Uh, I'm going to pass on that. I'm not. I know You're not that there's a person, are you, really? Yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, B12. I mean, B12 and folate should be a good part of the diet. I'm not sure if over treating with uh, B12 and folate would, would help the mm -hmm. But I tell you what, I will find the answer to that and I will post it on the group. Cool. Um, that's all the questions. Just one last comment. Has Shah got a new hairdo? Um, well, they, not scared to do anything with there, is there, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wouldn't throw stones from a glass house here. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very much for joining. There is, Thanks, C guys. there is a CPD point for tonight, if you've logged on for the majority of the lecture. I'll get certificates out soon. Please, thank you for supporting us, and please keep an eye on our WhatsApp group for further webinars. I'm sure we're posting something soon. But thank you very much, Mr. Kashani, for tonight, and Thanks, thank yeah. you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.